Okay, hello everyone. I'm Jorge Otero Pilos, Director of the Historic Preservation Program, and I am joined by our full time faculty, Andrew Dolcard. Hi. And Erica Avrami. Hello. And of course, we are transmitting live from our homes, uh, given the situation of the COVID 19. And I think all of you are watching from home. So we hope you're all healthy and well and we're looking forward to seeing you next fall. Um, we wanted to give you a sense of the program uh, in anticipation of our open house when we will be holding um, a live question and answer uh, session with you and wanted to talk to you in particular about our curriculum, which is um, an integrated curriculum. This is really a, a big point of differentiation from other schools, uh, which might be focused in a particular area of historic preservation. We believe our program's strength is that it provides you with a, with a broad foundation in the field of preservation. It's a professional program. It gets you ready to go out into the profession, uh, if you're already in the profession, the program is a great accelerator to get you from one place to another very quickly. Now we refer in shorthand to our curriculum as the SLAB curriculum, and each of these letters in this acronym stand for kind of general research areas that we focus on. The S stands for society, the L for laboratory research, the A for archives and historical work, and the B for buildings, the actual physical objects. Now, um, the whole curriculum is organized around a structure of three studios. Each studio is one semester, and they culminate in a thesis. So that's our two-year program. Each semester is a studio, and then the last semester is a thesis. There are a number of required classes that go along with these studios. So if you see, for example, Studio One, Studio One is really focused on the A and the B, and it's you know archives and buildings, and it is taught in conjunction with the classes that you see highlighted in blue. So those classes, like traditional American architecture and traditional building technology, feed into Studio One, uh, as well as preservation planning and policy and preservation theory and practice. So. So the whole curriculum is organized so that these classes are giving you particular important knowledge that is theoretical knowledge, that is practical knowledge, but then the studio, for those of you that have never been in a studio, is learning by doing. It's project-based, uh, so it's experiential learning. And you're taking this theoretical knowledge that you're learning in these classes and you're putting it to practice in those studios. And we're gonna talk about that in a second more in, in detail. Studio two focuses more on the S, the A, and the B. And studio three uh, has different focused sections that focus on the different aspects of S, L, A, or B in the slab. As you're going through the program, you're gonna be taking electives, which you see here in, there in white letters. And those are gonna be giving you uh, deep dives into different parts of historic preservation that might be informing what you wanna do as a thesis. And we'll talk a little bit more about the thesis as well. So this gives you an overview of the curriculum. Um, we, so let's now dive a little bit deeper into, into that curriculum by looking at Studio One, uh, which is led by Andrew Dolcard. So Studio One uh, is really your introduction to both studio and to preservation. And our, our objective is to look at different ways that we can understand buildings. Uh, and we do that uh, in, in various locations, but most particularly, we have, we have traditionally chosen a study area in New York where students have individual buildings that they work on, usually buildings that have not been extensively uh, researched. Uh, and here you can see us this past fall. Uh, we were out on our, our early semester field trip uh, talking about how we look at buildings, how we understand buildings. And we do a whole series of exercises, most of which are focused in whatever particular study area uh, we have chosen. So if we go to the next uh, image, 
we, uh, we often do a, a project uh, at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, uh, which is one of the most beautiful landscapes uh, in the New York area, and the cemetery with the largest number of, of major monuments and mausoleums in the country, and everybody gets one of these monuments. Uh, and it's an introduction on how to, to look at a building, how to do research, how to understand materials and materials deterioration. We do biographical research relating to uh, the, 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 the site. Uh, and uh, Columbia uh, Avery Library owns the Woodlawn Archive. And so we get to, to uh, use the archive to help us understand uh, the history of our monument and uh, the whole uh, complex of, of Woodlawn Cemetery. Um, and here you can see we're getting a, le a lesson in how correctly to use a ladder. Uh, can I have the next, please? Next, next slide, Jorge. Uh, we do a lot of archival work. Uh, we are in Avery Library extensively. Uh, and and uh, if there's no other reason to come to Columbia, it's then to, to experience Avery Library. It's the world's greatest architectural library. Uh, and here we are uh, learning how to use what I call non-traditional uh, resources. We're using atlases and real estate prospectuses and uh, view books and postcards and all kinds of other uh, resources to help us understand uh, buildings. And we, we go to the library extensively in various courses. Uh, if we, can I have the next, please? Um, we, after we've done the, the introduction on how to do research uh, and how to look at buildings and how to photograph buildings, everybody gets a major building in which they have to uh, do the research and the interpretation and understand what the significance of the building is, what its historical significance, what the significance of the materials are, and our buildings vary greatly. This is from uh, this past fall, uh, we had uh, mid-19th century banks, Art Deco apartment houses, that's a detail of one on the right, and next, uh, and including a, a number of mid-century modern churches uh, as well. So we're, we're looking at a huge variety of buildings and different ways that we can understand those buildings uh, and assess the significance of, of, of the building. Uh, and just to give everybody an introduction to what, what makes buildings so exciting and what they can tell us about a place. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing is the questions that you ask that help us to understand why a place is the way it is and why buildings look the way they do, why they're in the same condition that they are, uh, and, and, and how the city can come alive really by understanding these buildings. So I look forward to seeing you all in Studio One. So from documenting the, uh, the, the building's physical fabric and also it, the archives associated with the buildings in Studio One, Studio Two takes a, um, a, expands that to the area of the neighborhood and in the slab curriculum begins to focus more on the people, on the so social questions. Erica? So as Andrew explained, the inroad uh, in Studio One is really the building and taking a look at that building to help us understand the broader ramifications of what it is to preserve and why. In the case of Studio Two, as Jorge just explained, that lens really is the community, a broader context of not only multiple publics, but also a broader landscape uh, and the political dimensions of what it means to preserve. Um, how things get implemented through policy, um, as well as design and technical intervention. In this case, oops, I, was, I was just going to talk about the last slide. Thank you, Jorge. Um, in the case of this studio in Poughkeepsie, New York, for example, students looked at this question of social inclusion along an historic main street corridor that's both residential as well as commercial um, and has had a number of different populations move through 
uh, over the course of the last couple of centuries. And students applied this idea of preservation to the question of how can this main street be more socially inclusive? How can preservation play a role in that endeavor? Next slide, please. In the spring of 2019, for example, we expanded on that notion. We, in fact, looked at the community surrounding the Columbia campus uh, and asked questions about the university's development, about the evolution of institutions in the neighborhood. Uh, we looked at how the community had changed. On the left, that's actually a report from the 1950s looking at social demographics. Um, Andrew was a co-faculty in that studio, and as many of you may know, Andrew's written a book about the architecture of the Morningside Heights area. Uh, and this studio built upon that foundation of research about the buildings and really put them in an even broader societal context, thinking about not only the physical evolution at a neighborhood level, but what it means to be a member of this community today, how the history of multiple publics moving through this community has shaped the contours of memory and place within the neighborhood, um, and how preservation can take action in positive ways. Next slide. Um, we use a phrase instrumentalizing heritage in Studio Two, and really that's about how do we take this broad toolbox of preservation, whether it's interpretive design, as you see illustrated here uh, through an interpretive project looking at LGBTQ histories at Earl Hall on the Columbia campus, or on the right, uh, a series of uh, an exhibition that was installed at uh, a church that is now vacant in Harlem. In these cases, what Studio Two is trying to uh, do is really think about how the preservation toolbox can be applied toward broadening social participation, um, enhancing social cohesion, and thinking about how it may also become a means of securing uh, the protection of the environment and mitigating questions of climate change. Next slide. This semester, students were actually looking at Red Hook, Brooklyn, a place that has suffered from a long history of flooding um, that is being even more impacted by sea level rise and, and climate change. And so students were looking at another question of how to instrumentalize heritage, that of how do we promote equitable resilience through preservation uh, and through collaborative work. These studios are very, very collaborative. As you can see on the right, that's students working in the studio, developing issues and understanding uh, the key uh, uh, problems that the neighborhood confronts through a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and challenges analysis, known as a SWOP analysis. Uh, and they're looking to really, again, find ways in which preservation and heritage can be used to promote um, equity, resilience, uh, and essentially serve as a positive instrument of change within communities. Thank you, Erica. This, you know, one of the things that I always find amazing about Studio Two is that it really goes to the core of preservation. You know, because if if we're doing preservation, we're doing it for people. You know, that is that is you know, the purpose. And of course, you also mentioned the purpose, uh, the other purpose that we're all very concerned about in the program, which is climate change and how it's not an obvious thing, but how we can make historic preservation a tool for for change in positive change towards helping uh, solve the climate crisis. This is so important. And, and Studio Two has that broad breadth that is able to really get you thinking about just how to do it. Policy is a central aspect of, of, of all that. Um, it's so exciting. And uh, well, from Studio Two, we moved to Studio Three. Now, if you put yourself into the program, Studio Two, you're in your spring semester of your first year, and then you're going through the summer. And when you come back in the fall, 
you're coming into Studio 3. And in Studio 3, we, um, we focus different studios. We split up the class into different sections. And some of those sections focus, for example, on architectural design and adaptive reuse. And that is a studio that is done jointly with the Architecture Master of Architecture program. So here we travel. The third studio, so if we went from Studio One working on a building to thinking about society in a larger neighborhood context, now we're looking at a cross-cultural uh, studio. So we're going to a different kind of cultural realities and thinking about what is appropriate, what kind of our uh, preservation project is appropriate in this architectural, cultural, social, political context. And so here, for example, just to give you an idea, one of the studios we went to the United Nations in Geneva to work on a new entrance for the UN Human Rights Council building, which you can see over here, this is the conference building. This is the 1920s and 30s a League of Nations building. And this over here is actually a project by the students. Uh, this is so photorealistic that it almost looks like this building is actually built, but this, build, this over here is a, our student, uh, a student addition to the campus uh, designed by uh, Victor Hugo. Now we've been to other places. We've been working a lot on political buildings, buildings of diplomacy in the last few years, modern buildings. We've been working, for example, one of the projects took us to London to the U.S. Embassy in London because this embassy is being was sold by the United States government and is being now turned for uh, uh, to private development for a different use. It's very interesting when you look at the history of the site. The students looked at the research of uh, you know of each of these sites, how they're built up over time. You can see that the site uh, here on the picture on the right was already built before the U.S. Embassy came in. There were some some townhouses there. Those were torn down for the embassy. And then, of course, the students here, you see this little frame over here in 2017, they were thinking about how do they incorporate new program through a rooftop addition. So this is very exciting because students think about new kinds of technologies that can be integrated into old buildings to extend their serviceable life. And that goes from structures to mechanical systems, to new kinds of you know, accessibility questions. And so we begin to deal with some of the questions at Studio Two. What is the social purpose of this building, the new social purpose? And also, can we think about questions of climate change through, uh, for example, the new systems, the new technologies that are gonna be incorporated here? So this is another project where students went to Mexico to work on the US Embassy in Mexico, which is also being decommissioned. And here's a wall section that the students did. We have access to the, their archives, students research the history. So we don't forget the lessons from Studio One and Studio Two, but we develop them now with, uh, in architectural solutions. And so uh, now, for example, the wall section is very important because this building has absolutely no insulation. It's just one sheet of stone in the facade and that's it. So it has a lot of mechanical uh, environmental problems. So students begin to deal with those kinds of questions and also passive systems, but also really uh, the new aesthetics. How, do you, how does preservation look and feel is very important for how people can engage with it. People recognize that this is a historic building because of the way it looks and feels and those interventions through design can also guide our attention to understand what is important, what is significant about the building, what are its character defining features, how do we highlight those. And so here on the left you see a, 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 a project by one of the students for a new entrance that is through the courtyard, the old courtyard which is here on the right. One of the particularities of the Mexico Embassy is that the lobby was raised up off the ground so it's a big accessibility problem people can't get into the building in a wheelchair so how do you lower that ground plane and create an interesting entrance so these kinds of questions uh, are what students work on but we travel we go to the different places and in those places we actually learn about the history of the building culture the social culture we visit heritage sites um, and understand how 
the very notion of heritage has evolved within this country and how can we make our design interventions culturally and socially appropriate within the, net, the, the framework, the political, economic, cultural framework of, the, of this location. So for that, we do a lot of research before we get there, and then we also visit sites while we're there. And it's a lot of fun. <laughs> now, we, another one of the studios is led by Erica. As Jorge explained, Studio 3 really extends the learning from both Studio 1 and Studio 2. Uh, I teach a Studio 3 that's focused on preservation planning. So again, we're looking at these questions of context, the broader issues that are political, historical, social, economic, environmental, that are affecting uh, individual sites within that context, or that may be affecting the entirety of the community. Um, what we would call an historic city or an historic area or um, an, ur an historic urban landscape. This past fall, uh, we focused our studies on Freetown in Sierra Leone, which has a very long history associated with enslaved peoples. Um, it was in fact a colony uh, dating back a couple of hundred years um, where uh, African Americans who had been enslaved and who had fought on the side of the British during the Revolutionary War were afforded their freedom by the British, transferred first to Nova Scotia and then to what is now Freetown. And likewise, after the abolition of the international slave trade, um, or at least the outlawing of the international slave trade, um, British Navy forces intercepted uh, slave ships and would emancipate those on board in Freetown. So it's actually quite a cosmopolitan city, having been populated by uh, freed peoples from all over the West African coast. Students were looking at uh, a number of different heritage resources, including religious uh, resources, houses that date back a couple of hundred years, as well as in the case of uh, the lower left, Bunce Island, which was um, a slave trading fort on the estuary uh, of the river outside the city. And they were looking at ways in which heritage could become um, an economic driver and a driver of, uh, of community development for publics within Sierra Leone. They worked with students from Fora Bay College um, we emphasize that kind of collaboration in Studio 2, but we expand on it in Studio 3 by bringing in additional students in our field work, faculty, um, and a broader array of stakeholder organizations from government agencies to not-for-profits to private entities. Next slide, please, Jorge. Uh, in the fall of 2018, we worked in Montgomery, Alabama, um, as Jorge said, these are cross-cultural and oftentimes those of us who are from the United States might think we're all Americans. Um, but in the case of Montgomery, you know, students learned that there, was, there were histories and cultures that were not so familiar to them. Again, we explored slavery histories, but also um, the histories associated with reconstruction here in the United States and the era of racial terror, um, as well as Native American histories that were in fact not very present um, in the landscape in Montgomery, even though Montgomery is well known both for its civil rights history as well as its civil war history being um, the first capital of the Confederacy. And so students had to grapple with the tensions that all of these multiple histories represent um, and the stakeholders that are behind each of them. At the same time, they explored physical resources, like on the bottom, that's actually an elevation, a drawing from the 1980s uh, and imagery uh, from the present day below that, uh, that shows changes along Dexter Avenue in Montgomery, which was the final stretch of the Selma to Montgomery March during the Civil Rights era. 
And so these kinds of questions engage students in, in mapping techniques using GIS, field data collection techniques, interview techniques, focus groups with stakeholders, um, and really builds a rich set of skills uh, for their use in professional life. Next slide, please. Uh, in Lalibela, in Ethiopia, uh, students focused on a World Heritage Site of rock-hewn churches. These churches are actually carved out of a mountain. Um, they are monolithic. Uh, they're dated uh, about 800 years old. Uh, and so they focused on a question of tourism as a World Heritage Site. Um, there are moments and times of intense tourism. Uh, at Lalibela, it's also still a sacred pilgrimage site and has a very strong uh, religious association and uh, a community of peoples that not only uh, undertake the pilgrimage uh, each year, but also those who live nearby who frequent um, the site on a daily basis. And so how to balance these different interests, these tourists who uh, want to engage and who are indeed welcomed at the site, but at the same time, their presence can transform not only the site itself, but the surrounding community. And so students grappled with those issues. They undertook more than 150 one-to-one um, -one surveys. They did interviews with government authorities. Uh, tour guides, et cetera, to really understand the dynamics of tourism and how preservation can, can um, help to promote more sustainable tourism and more equitable tourism. Last slide, I think. Oh, not last slide. Um, we actually did two studios in Haiti and Port-au-Prince um, looking at a series of gingerbread houses um, these are a sort of vernacular architecture specific to um, uh, Haiti. And students were looking at A, how they had survived after the earthquake. And in fact, they were very resilient after the earthquake. And then B, looked to different policy mechanisms as to how they might be preserved because many are still in private ownership. And in fact, they discovered through a, a vast survey that they did of over 300 properties, um, they were able to determine that um, there is still a, a, a number of them that are used for educational purposes. And in fact, a number of schools moved to these houses after the earthquake because of their resilience. Uh, and so students were really looking at ways in which they could design preservation approaches that would enable these kinds of institutions um, and private owners to protect these houses as part of the Haitian and Port-au-Prince landscape um, while also ensuring their public access and public benefit. Last slide, I think. Um, and all of these studios actually result in uh, a published report. Um, part of what we are training students to do is produce a professional level report and to be able to walk out of their experience, their studio experience with a published document that they can show to potential employers um, and demonstrate their ability to work in a team, uh, to undertake this kind of deep research and proposal development uh, and to communicate um, effectively in these cross-cultural situations. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Erica. This is so exciting. And this is, um, you know, these reports that are, these reports that are um, uh, product of these studios become really central to the protection of these sites. And we've heard many times that the, the, managers of these sites, the people in charge of the sites, uh, have been successful in advancing preservation goals thanks to the information uh, and the work and the research that was done in these studios. You know, the, coming out of these studios, students really have a portfolio of works. This is part of their portfolio of works that they do in the studios. And this is very important also for your professional life. You know, this is the, the beginning of, of your professional life to, to have these, these works. 
The other studio that we've uh, done in the last few years is a preservation technology studio, which focuses on the kind of long wedge of history of, of uh, digital technologies and their impact in historic preservation, as we're uh, seeing the application into preservation of technologies that were developed for other purposes. So 3D scanning, for example, or even um, drones and surveillance cameras are now being used to 3D scan buildings and produce uh, sometimes replicas of these buildings, or they're opening up new ideas about what preservation can be. So in this case, this was a very interesting studio in which a building in Spain, a church in Spain, had been essentially taken apart into fragments, and some of them are, some of those fragments are here in New York, some of them are in other places, in other museums. And so when you go to the church in Spain now, half of it is missing. And so what they did was to go scan, the uh, students went to scan the pieces of the building that are in all these different places, and then tried to virtually reconstruct the entire uh, church with all of the surfaces in it. Um, some other studios have taken on other problems that now through digital technology we can begin to address. This is a house in Spain that has an incredible collection of Renaissance tiles, um, each handmade, each falling apart. And the question is, how do we replace this in a way that doesn't look like now we're just putting factory made tiles? So they worked on how to scan the tiles and then how to make replicas of these tiles that they could go back to the surfaces. And if you see over here, they use various new techniques uh, from 3D scanning to using photogrammetry to develop three-dimensional uh, surfaces and, and models. You can see over here, this is the 3D scan that they developed. It's actually quite difficult to 3D scan a tile because it has a, a gloss to it that uh, throws off the light. So there was a lot of work that had to be perfected in order to get to this. And then you can see here the students began playing with how to 3D replicate the mold, which would then be used to make an actual tile with, with different colors in, um, and different enamels uh, that would be put on them. And so they actually fired some of these in the lab and made some, some replicas. So that takes you through the studio sequence. It's, a, it's really a robust foundation in the, in the, in the, 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 the profession. Uh, gets you exposed to all the aspects of the profession from the social laboratory, the archival historical and the building aspects, the aesthetics of preservation, the technology of preservation. Once you finish your Studio 3, you move on to really think about what are you passionate about, and you do that in your thesis. And so your thesis is really a, a, a year-long process in which you go do a deep dive into a particular subject. Uh, Erica and uh, um, Andrew, feel free to jump in because each of us serve as as um, advisors in these theses. So we accompany the work of the students in their year-long research project. Um, so here, here's one example of one student who has been working on testing new line mortar replacements for historic buildings and testing their performance, which one works better and worse. Um, a lot of these are made by, fact, uh, by you know, industrial manufacturers that make certain claims about these products, sometimes those claims are not true. And so the thesis is a way to actually bring science uh, to, um, to dispel some of, the, some of the performance claims that are made and to really pick the one that is right. But there are some theses that focus, for example, on policy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and really um, take innovative approaches as well. We had a student a couple of years ago, uh, an architect who was very much interested in community-based design and engagement in questions of heritage who not only undertook research within a small community in the country of Colombia, uh, produced a video as part of her um, 
uh, research where she actually hosted a community engagement activity on site um, and, uh, and use that as an opportunity to collect data on people's memories and attachment to the place who lived within this village. Uh, and so thesis really is an opportunity to be extremely cr creative, to be provocative. Um, as Jorge said, it's, you know, you can test things and, and, and certainly we always want your, want your thesis to be evidence-based. You are building upon a body of knowledge that's out in the preservation field or in allied fields, and, but you're bringing to bear a new lens uh, a new thought, a new avenue um, that enables you as a burgeoning professional to really begin to chart a, a path forward in the field. Other theses, for example, are uh, more focused on uh, archival historical work. Andrew? Yeah, so, um, so students are choosing all kinds of interesting projects that, that, uh, that combine the use of history and architectural history with preservation. So this year, for example, a student is focused on a, a very important corporate modernist who was one of the people who really defined the character of Los Angeles in the post-war period, but whose work not only has been neglected, but several of whose major works are about to be demolished. Uh, and so uh, she has decided that he needs to be um, looked at again uh, and, and uh, has is in the midst of writing a thesis that, that reappraises uh, this architect Perea's work. Another student, uh, one of our international students from China, is writing a thesis on uh, basically a history of sites related to LGBT history in Beijing, uh, which is really pioneering uh, work. So, you know, people are doing all kinds of interesting things and most importantly, topics that they have a real passion for. And other students are working on experimental preservation design theses on how preservation looks and feels. Um, they're looking at, for example, the kind of an experiential interpretive design that has been done in different sites, including light and sound or even smells. Um, so really a broad range, a very experimental range. I think one of the things that really characterizes the thesis is that we push for is um, really, they, they, they try to take on orthodoxies, things that we believe, uh, you know, people kind of take for granted, but they really push the envelope on that. And so they're really research, research driven. Um, we're very proud of those theses. Uh, we encourage you to look at them online. Uh, they are on our website. Um, the other thing that some of the theses do is they, they, they um, some of the students in their thesis, they might be focusing their thesis along with a dual degree. So uh, we have a dual degree in preservation and urban planning. Some of those students, Erica, maybe you can talk a little bit more about this. You know, we'll Absolutely. For example, we have a student uh, this year who uh, is a dual degree with urban planning and preservation who's focusing on uh, the transfer of development rights. Um, and how that has shaped uh, the landscape of New York uh, fairly dramatically, uh, where we have a very robust tool of transferring development rights uh, in order to protect uh, historic resources. Uh, and so she's chosen a couple of interesting case studies, the High Line, uh, as well as the, the Broadway Theater Subdistrict, both of which um, are, are using what we call TDR, Transfer of Development Rights, uh, with an eye toward understanding how they've not only formally changed the landscape, but also uh, changed the community, socially, economically, as well. Other, other students have done theses that, that engage with uh, architecture. They do dual degrees in preservation architecture, others preservation and real estate. So really, when you're a student here, you're really a member of the whole school and you're engaged in, in the whole school. I think for me, one of the really uh, differentiating factors apart from our curriculum and the, the really the, the strength of the studio and thesis sequence, um, which is really widely recognized in the profession as, as uh, has a tremendous amount of value when you go out and get a job like the, the Columbia degree. But it's also, I think, one of the big differentiating factors is for you to think about who are you going to be doing this work with? 
Uh, and that's why I want us to spend just a little a moment uh, on thinking about, um, uh, you know, think about the, 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 the work that you're going to do here in that context. You know, you're going to be thinking, you're going to be working with each other and you're going to be working with the faculty um, and you're going to be working with each other both in class and out of class. Uh, we emphasize a lot the, the, the collaborative nature of our program. You know, we work in teams, as Erica mentioned, in Studio Two, Studio One, but we also have other moments where you can work, uh, where you develop a kind of uh, a camaraderie. And uh, uh, we do summer workshops between Studio One, Studio, uh, Studio Two, and Studio Three, where you travel abroad. Um, these are sponsored by the school. So we've sent, for example, students to, to Cuba to work on a preservation project there. Uh, we really emphasize, you know, being in the place and, and hands-on understanding. So a lot of what we do um, in class involves going on field trips, actually seeing preservation work being done, um, seeing preservationists discuss their work on site, um, visiting important buildings that are heritage sites, um, like for example, the, uh, the, the tour on the left of the United Nations by one of our adjunct faculty, uh, uh, Michael Adlerstein, who also led the uh, sustainable retrofit of the whole United Nations uh, campus as Assistant Secretary General to the United Nations. So New York is a great laboratory, a great place to see preservation in action. And uh, we believe firmly to take you out and understand the profession, also by taking you into the offices where this is happening. So architects offices, engineer offices, uh, uh, planning offices, municipal uh, government offices. So you really get exposed and begin to network, understand what preservation is. We are, uh, we like to be, and we are a small program, and we are very uh, uh, proud of that. We really cultivate a community, a scholarly community. We have lecture series um, every week, um, either on campus. We sometimes, uh, for example, Erica, you want to talk a little bit about this, this uh, off-campus lecture that you organize? Absolutely. So uh, as full-time faculty, um, in addition to teaching and engaging with students through the classroom and through studios and through some of this field and lab work that we've explained so far, um, we also have uh, research work that we do. And oftentimes we're able to bring students into those projects as well. I've been working on a multi-year project that's looking at the um, at heritage policy um, at the municipal level here in the US, thinking about how we can shift more toward uh, questions of inclusion, sustainability, uh, as well as equity. And so on the right, that's just an example of how we uh, included a public panel um, that allowed for a broader audience um, as part of uh, one of the research symposia that we hosted, which uh, really focused uh, an, about 25 uh, practitioners, academics, and policymakers around some of these questions. We've hosted three of them so far. Um, we've been uh, graciously able to host these in the Empire State Building at the offices of World Monuments Fund. Um, and it gives us a, an almost like a retreat like atmosphere so that we can really um, have deep um, conversations in, a, in a, a safe space and speak candidly about the future of the field. Um, and in each case, I've been able to bring in uh, three uh, uh, students to serve as research assistants as part of uh, the symposia and the projects. I think that's a really important point because uh, we always include students in the research. The students are really part of, you know, like colleagues. They are always included in faculty activities. After the lectures, we always go out to dinner. The students join, get a chance to network with the speakers and get a chance to really be part of the profession right from the get-go. So it's, 
it's part lecture, but it's also part career services because you know people are beginning to develop their persona in the profession in also informal ways. We also organize international symposia at the school on different topics every year. They're called the Fitch Colloquium in honor of our founder, James Marston Fitch, on different topics from experimental preservation technology to the moving of monuments or preservation and war. These are some of the topics that we've covered in recent years, uh, inviting really people that are at the foreground of the big structural changes that are happening in preservation right now to come to Columbia and share their knowledge with us. It's a, it's a really fun event. We also um, cultivate a scholarly culture. You know, the, there are other scholars, that, that not only the faculty, but we also have visiting scholars, PhD students, and a whole culture of really theoretical, historical, critical work about preservation. And we uh, have the journal Future Anterior that collects that work and also um, sponsors some of that some of that research. And we encourage you, of course, to to look at those issues that are online. But I think it's important to say this is uh, managed uh, by students. So one of our TA ships is the Future Anterior uh, teaching assistantship that uh, student really gets to work with the top thinkers in the field to publish their, their work. We're uh, program councils, students are represented, um, choose a representative and are represented in our faculty discussions, um, in, in decision making about the program. We share knowledge about where we're going as a program. We really believe in very open dialogue with our students. The students are very tightly knit it's a really great community. I'd say that it's, it's a very supportive community. It's not competitive. Um, you know, people really are here. We're all invested in you having a rich learning experience that is going to be long lasting and, and valuable to you in the long run. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, Erica, uh, Andrew, you wanted to say a little bit about this community because um, I always feel that that uh, that one of the things that I like about the program is I like to be with the people in the program. These are all people that I that I enjoy spending time with, and Andrew, of course, is 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 one of them. He's well, I'm a, as a graduate of the program and uh, a member of the community. I. I I always like to say that uh, one of the joys of being a preservationist is that it attracts really, really nice people. Uh, and, and you spend your whole life uh, talking with and dealing with just really fantastic people. Uh, and our community is small and very tight knit. Uh, and and um, you know, this is a really great asset uh, we, we, with our very loyal alumni association, uh, we are, are, are able to create uh, an environment both for students and for alums uh, that, that uh, makes our field so interesting and exciting. I would, I would simply add that uh, the, um, when, we, when I think about academic community at Columbia, it's well beyond the Graduate School of Architecture, Preservation and Planning. The university as a whole um, is really such a tremendous resource of, of people, of, of libraries, of, of research, of think tanks, uh, all of that. I actually am also a graduate of the preservation program, as well as a graduate of Columbia College. I was in um, the, the second class that admitted women at Columbia College, so I'm dating myself. Um, but that's to say that I, I have a tremendous respect and reverence for the overall Columbia University community. And uh, we uh, consistently find ways to try and connect outside of the school, whether that is through um, the, the research project that I mentioned, which is undertaken in collaboration with the Earth Institute and the American Assembly, which is a public policy think tank. 
um, or whether that is finding ways to connect with the School of Engineering on a materials-based question or um, a documentation question. Um, so it really is uh, such a broad resource of, of more than uh, 30,000 students and 15,000 faculty and other staff members, if I remember correctly. So um, you are part of almost a, a, a small city. Yes, I think that's a really important point that the program is really benefits from being both small and have you, students get a lot of attention, but then you're in this larger school and larger you know, research university that gives you access to all these resources. Well, thank you all for paying attention. Thank you all for joining us for this, um, this uh, you know, uh, presentation of our program. We look forward to the Q&A on, uh, on April 1st and uh, looking forward to meeting you soon in, uh, in September uh, back here at, uh, in New York.